He's done it again. Antonio Felix de Costa makes it back-to-back wins in Berlin, but it was yet another poor day for his title rivals. Is the Formula E Championship now as good as over? This is the Inside Electric Podcast, and I am your host, Rob Watts. So it was a huge day in the title race today, uh, the second race of six in Berlin. And it feels like we are going to be talking quite a lot about Antonio Felix da Costa this coming week. With me to chat through all of the day's action is Inside Electric co-founder Hazel Southwell. And we're also very pleased to say that we are joined by a special guest this evening. It's Director of Digital Strategy for the Motorsport Network, Jess McFadden. Hello, Jess. Hi, thanks so much for having me, guys. You're very welcome. And, and I, I feel very pleased that I nailed the job title there, Early Doors. So that's gone well. Uh, if you are a first time listener, we are an independent podcast covering Formula E and electric motorsport. You can find us on the socials at Inside Electric or online at inside electric.com. Coming up in this episode, just how dominant is Antonio Felix? Felix da Costa in this car right now and can he keep it up uh, with the championship looking as good as over now uh, we'll be discussing the fight behind him in Formula E 1.5 as Sebastian Buemi called it today and with some teams form seeming to desert them we'll also be talking through some of the winners and losers from the first two races in Berlin so uh, I feel like we have to start with uh, Antonio Felix da Costa um, Hazel, it was a dominant performance. You can't really pick another word for it. He seems supremely uh, confident and comfortable in this car right now. Um, from my personal memory, it's probably the most at one with a car I have seen a driver in Formula E probably since uh, Sebastian Buemi's early seasons. How do you rate De Costa right now after these two race wins? Look, I think it's really easy to get carried away on uh, hyping De Costa's performance, but he scored 30 points yesterday. He only scored 28 today. Um, so oh. if he doesn't, if he doesn't get he's declining and only takes the win, then he'll only be on 25. Like you know, I, I don't, I don't think. Um, no, obviously, it's it's is De Costa's career over? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, no, obviously it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. He, the lines that he is taking, the confidence with which he's driving and the obvious uh, comfort that he seems to have in the car is just completely on a different level to the other drivers. It's on a different level to his teammate, quite starkly. Um, he's able to take this sort of strange V line into the attack mode zone that nobody else seems to be able to nail. Um, every corner is going his way on the hot laps. Like, Sebastian Buemi did manage to pip him for the fastest in the group stages, but nobody could touch him for, in Super Bowl. Um, and he's just getting speed and performance out of the car that nobody else is. I mean, in the race early on, it, everyone assumed that he was uh, over-consuming um, and that he wouldn't be able to, to hold on to the end and that he would be pounced on by the, the cars who didn't have energy issues behind him. And then he finished the race with more energy than anyone else, pretty much, in yeah. the final laps. And fully it's able. Really to impressive. Um, like, you, you just, it is just staggering. For a series like Formula E, where you do not get these kind of runaway performances, because you just don't have gaps between the cars of, of this sort of magnitude, he was a good two corners ahead by the time he um, actually finished the race. And that, I mean, it doesn't sound like much. Like, if that's an F1 thing, then you're you're thinking about, like, Hamilton with half his wheel off, uh, only winning by two corners or whatever. Um, but in Formula E, that's a big margin. And, like, you just... If you're another driver, you've got to be looking at him going, like, well, what, what am I meant to do about this? Yeah, Jess, Jess what, do you, what do you make of it? Because uh, there must be a few drivers scratched in their heads looking at that the pace that he's got in that that car and 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 how much performance he's able to extract from it at the moment and I mean it, it's a stretch to say he looks unbeatable because we know Formula E can go from naught to ridiculous very quickly but it is difficult to see anyone kind of topping his performances at the moment. Yeah I think as well with Formula E we're so used to it being really close at the top you know going 
right down to the wire in terms of who's going to top the championship and come away with with uh, with the world championship. But it's just he just as Hazel said, he just looks so comfortable, so collected. He's also one of those drivers that, I mean, I'm so glad that he's found his foot in Formula E, but, you know, he's one of those drivers that kind of missed out on Formula One, but he's really come into his own in Formula E this season. Um, and it's just, it's really good. It's really, it's, it's exciting to see, but it's also quite puzzling because the gap shouldn't be that big in theory. Um, so what is it that he's doing? You know, as Hazel pointed out, is it the lines? Is it just the fact that He's so comfortable in that car, and and what is the what is the discrepancy between him and his teammate? Because he was really not having a good time of it today. And I love the fact that they spoke about um, Jeff started talking French to his engineers, which is a clear sign he is not a happy bunny um, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to that. So, yeah, it's just it's it. On one hand, it's great to see, but we don't want that Formula E point five. Um, coming into it because it is always a criticism of, of other series like Formula One or MotoGP where you've got an out and out winner um, before the seasons even come to halfway point. Um, but you, it's 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 also fascinating to watch, uh, and I'd love to know like kind of the ins and outs a bit more about what is going on at, at that team. I think it was always there was always a possibility with having six races at one circuit. I know that we are having three different layouts, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a unique place, the Berlin Temple Hof. The, um, the, the track surface is, is quite different to a lot of other circuits as well. And I think there was always the possibility that one team might turn up in Berlin and just nail it from the start and then once you found that rhythm and you found that setup, um, you know, it, it, it might be tricky it, it, to, for, for another team to, to sort of beat them now. But, and I think in, in previous seasons, the, the nature of every single Formula E track being so different means that we tend to get a lot of mixed up results. But yeah, as Hazel said, uh, you mentioned there, Hazel, he's taking that unusual line into the attack mode. Um, he he's figured out if if anyone's not seen it so normally what what most of the drivers do is you you arrive at the opening of the attack mode area and then you go all the way through and then you exit and you stay within the perimeters of that but antonio felix de costa has realized that the first activation point you don't actually have to hit it at the angle that the uh, the paint on the track kind of suggests so he's it might only be maybe a tenth or, or two that he's saving but if you have a, a driver behind you and you're able to take that attack mode and get back out in your position that's an ing that's a genius piece of thinking from him ha is that a, a marker of the confidence that he's got right now the fact that he's doing that do you think or, or do you guys think that maybe it's more a case of he feels like he's got to work super hard to find these advantages to stay to stay ahead i think it's probably coincidence i think it's something he noticed in free practice um or has perhaps noticed on the simulator and then wanted to test in free practice um if you didn't have the car control that antonio has at the moment um and like formula e cars they've got no downfalls um they're difficult to steer they're incredibly heavy at the back um, obviously because the, the battery and powertrain is all in the back, there's very little in the front other than uh, the kind of back, back ring ram uh, front wing on the Gen 2 cars um, uh, and, and the steering column. Um, but the, they're, they're difficult to control. The last time I was uh, paying quite a lot of attention to Antonio in Berlin, it was when he was driving an absolute dog of a car. Um, in season three, um, when uh, basically the Andretti was just totally unsteerable. It was like you could see them physically wrestling, both him and Robin, uh, that year physically wrestling the car um, as they went round, because you can get quite a lot of an aerial view in Tempelhof in a way that you don't in some Formula E circuits. Um, and uh, yeah, th this time, obviously, he's got that. He's got it in a situation where he can perfectly control it, um, where he feels very comfortable 
um, and where he totally trusts the car. And I think like for Antonio, that's incredibly important. He told me at the end of season four, which was another miserable season for him um, in, in an uncompetitive Andretti uh, or BMW. It was when it was sort of shifting to being BMW. Um, and uh, he wanted to retire from the final race in season four because he was so totally miserable. And then he won the yeah. first race of season five, of course, in Diria. Um, and I think Antonio knows a bad car and he's clearly got a good one at the moment. And I think he's basically spent so many years wrestling really, really like just dirt awful cars to maybe get a point that all of that experience is now paying off into a car that actually has the capacity to deliver wins and um, in which he feels comfortable and where he can actually trust it. Um, because for, well, for any driver, but particularly he's told me before that, that like he started not being able to race properly when he had the really awful cars in season three and four because he simply couldn't trust the car. And he felt like there was almost no point being on track some of the time because he couldn't do anything with it as a race driver. So I think what we're seeing is, is an Antonio who's in a place where he can exploit those kind of tiny gains, those kind of marginal gains that he had to have an eye out for because they were his only opportunity for so long. Um, but in a, in a comfortable position, where he can actually sort of make something of them more than like maybe not being last or whatever. Yeah, it's 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 really fascinating to see his development. Um, not not just this season, but since he left. Um, well, actually, since since he got rid of that dog awful car, really, um, and and he had a decent one in season five, and then obviously this season he seems to have come on a step forward. Um, Jess, you mentioned there about how. Um, you know, it, it's nice to see Antonio Felix to Costa in this position because I think a lot of people um, kind of maybe thought that he was unlucky to not have made it to Formula One. He was one of the drivers who kind of got chewed up and spat out by the Red Bull program. Although he 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 is still quite loyal to them, and and, and he, you won't find Antonio Felix to Costa criticizing them too much. He, I remember he telling me in Marrakesh a couple of years ago how much respect he had for Helmut Marco. Uh, his exact quote was, I love Helmut, which is... Um, Please perhaps, edit that soundbite in. Yeah, I've, I've actually got, I've still got the exact soundbite. Um, but it was great to see him finally find his home in Formula E. If he were to win this championship, which it looks like he probably will now, um, Jess, how how do you think this will be as in terms of a, a redemption story? Because we have a, we've had a lot of those in Formula E. Um, it, it feels like it will be sort of validation for for De Costa that you know he he's been able to finally prove his worth in in a in a team and a car and a championship that he feels totally at home in now. Well, like Hazel said, it's been a long time coming. Um, he's not had an easy route to here, um, and here we are seeing what arguably is his, his, his true potential, whether it's his full potential, um, that's another question. Um, but it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those situations where I love seeing these, um, the way that Formula E has evolved over time and the conversation is switching less and less towards it's where wannabe F1 drivers go to die. And more to, you know, I don't think we've ever, <laughs> yeah, I know. Hopefully what, not what to say. die. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the media centre. Yeah, that's the media. Uh, career death <laughs> rather than uh, physical one, <laughs> um, But yeah, it's, it's, it's become less and less of that. And I don't think we've ever seen such a competitive grid as we have and as we have today. And it's, it's, it's just case in point that these drivers, you know, I, I, it's, you get to see them do things that they should have always done had they gone through the normal what is deemed the normal motorsport route which is f1 which is the pinnacle and being able to see them battle on track is and it's just it's just great to see um so i think is it going to be a redemption story that's always a hard one to say because there are still so many critics of this series 
Um, and I guess that depends on who you speak to, but has he come through and had a, you know, I guess Jev is, is, is a similar example of somebody that was absolutely chewed up and spat out uh, of the F1 scene, um, but has had great success with Formula E. And I don't think anyone would doubt or criticize him in terms of his prowess as a racing driver. So it's, I think it, it comes part and parcel with the way that Formula E is moving forward as a series. It's, it's less about, oh, well, at least he got a Formula E drive to actually yeah. he's a out and out racing driver that can go off and boss anything that he, that he puts his mind to. So I think that's, that's where it's kind of a, it's a coming together of two elements. One is a, a, as a racing driver getting the kind of um, the credit they deserve and also the series moving forward uh, in terms of its evolution. You talk about the ultimate redemption story there, um, Jev's career arc. Um, it's quite a funny moment we had recently before the And We Go Green film was released. We were discussing this and I said, um, I hadn't seen And We Go Green. Hazel had, but I hadn't. And I was saying to the guys, do you know what? I, I, I think one day I reckon they might, they, they can make a film out of Jev's career because it is the ultimate redemption story, you know, like so much promise in his early career, a lot of pressure on him. It didn't come to be. He, he got spat out of Formula One. He was down. He didn't want to be in Formula E. And then he's risen up. And now he's this glorious champion. And Hayes was like, Rob, that is, is basically, and we go great. That is literally the plot of and we go great. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Well, I haven't seen it. I have now. But, um, but yeah, in terms of career arcs, uh, Jev is obviously um, the ultimate redemption story Antonio Felix da Costa I think would be also a fantastic story for Formula E um, were he to go on and, and, and complete the job now and win this championship let's talk a little about a little bit about his teammate uh, Jev Jean-Eric Verne he does look a little bit short on confidence at the moment you mentioned there he was talking French on the radio which he tends to do when he's not entirely happy about something. He starts having a little rant in French. Um, hasn't been on it today at all. Um, and there was a little bit of uh, needle. It did feel like there was a little bit of an atmosphere in the post-race press conference. Hazel, you have your own thoughts on what might be behind that. Yeah, I I think he's um, so Jeff's really frustrated with uh, Degrassi yesterday and Mortara today. He was caught in some incidents which you could possibly call robust racing, and you particularly in Formula E because there is a lot of kind of like argy bargy between the cars. Like it's probably gonna fly, but he felt very strongly that both incidents both incidents god it's hard to talk after two days of racing <laughs> isn't it um, so there, there's only another yeah. seven or whatever it is to go um, i just don't want to have to say to cheetah again so we'll, we'll move on quickly. <laughs> yeah if, if somebody else could win so that we can oh, god if he wins them all i'm i'm, I'm not doing these podcasts <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just, just gonna i just call them ds yeah <laughs> it's just um but yeah, uh, he felt um, that the incident should have been investigated by the stewards. Um, he felt that Degrassi should have been penalised the previous day and that Mortara put him in the wall um, uh, this race and so should also have uh, at least faced an investigation. I think, so there's some history for this within Tachita, um, but it was back when Pedro de la Rosa was there as the team... In sporting director or something yeah yeah um uh, some sort of role um i think in essentially driver placation um and yes he did uh, have a big role in that yeah he did um so uh, you remember when uh sam bird hit andre lotterer in an overtake for the lead of the hong kong e Prix and then was penalized out of the win yes um, yeah. So Tachita issued a protest against Sam Bird's initial penalisation to push for a harsher penalisation, um, which was ultimately rejected. Um, it's kind of a load of silly waste of money to do these things, um, but it is the kind of thing that if you're a driver and you're kind of having 
a a really bad time and you want to feel that the team supports you then they might be like all right we're going to chuck four thousand euros at the fia to be like can we do this um jed yeah. felt i think that the team were not supporting him sufficiently in pursuing both of these being uh, looked at by the stewards or at least he wanted more attention about it um or just that he was pissed off um to that extent obviously the other side of the garage is celebrating and there is no other side of the garage with Formula E, you know, you are, you, <laughs> there's, there's not really anything in between. Um, and it's the same crew and it's the same 20 people for both cars, basically. Um, you'll, you'll each have your own engineers to some extent, but, but pretty much everything is shared. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think an attention deficit to, to Jeb's woes, um, perhaps but I don't think actually beef with each other. So they did they did have this slightly weird atmosphere in the press conference, but I think it was because they were late because Jeb was trying to get them to lodge stuff with the stewards, basically. Um, and Antonio was, because he as he walked into the press conference, he was like, how late do we have to stay here? Basically, because he was obviously like, I want to go, man. <laughs> like, um, uh, but yeah, um, I think tired and emotional, um, but but not necessarily. We've I think all that, been there, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah after after a double head, uh, if I was told when I've been told, actually this happened in Riyadh this year, um, I got told I had to do a bunch of interviews with like Saudi TV, um, or, or got asked nicely in a quite do these interviews Hazel way. Um, and honestly, I nearly cried because I was doing one at 9pm and I was just like, I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to do this right now. So like, I, I yeah. do understand how they feel. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've all been there in the media centre at like 10 o'clock when you think you're about to go home and then someone gets disqualified and you're like, I just want to go, I do want to go home. <laughs> so yeah, we can totally understand that. Um, but Jeff, yeah, he, he doesn't look like he's entirely comfortable with the car at the moment. I nearly said this weekend, as I did many times last, last night, this, this week, this weekday. Um, but if anyone can turn that around, um, you know, he can. And what's the next circuit? Like, is it traditional one next? Yeah. And then it's the funky one. The wiggly boy. Yeah. Wiggly boy, I love that. Yeah, it is quite wiggly, isn't it? Um, I hope it's, it's sort not going like to be the Berlin Templehof circuit, but like in SpongeBob meme, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I worked this out earlier. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think based on my tremendously reliable maths, um, Antonio Felix da Costa has a 68 point lead, which is ridiculous. Um, and he's got, I think, four times as many points as Jeff now. So I think we can say that Jeff's not going to get a third title this year. Um, and he's still mathematically we... in the running. Only seven drivers are now out. Well, of... Rust and Cesar Camera are out, which is disappointing. Um, um, Massa, Johnny. Uh, Turvey, Mwela and Lynn are all out. Um, I'm sad for Turvey. Um, Massa and Jani, I kind of saw that one on the cards. I, I thought their championship hopes were fading, but I am sad for Turvey. But the good news is Turvey uh, can still support his teammate because Daniel Abt is uh, still in the running. So, Yes, that uh, will be intriguing to see how that pans out in there in the next races. Um, so, uh, yeah, we mentioned Sebastian when we joked about Formula E 1.5. And Jess, you said that no one really wants to see any championship have a 1.5. We, we've had some jokes and there's quite a popular Twitter and Instagram account for Formula 1.5, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of removes, I think, Mercedes and Ferrari from it. Um, we don't want to see that, but we kind of got that a little bit at the moment. Do we think now that that's it, it's over? as a championship? See, it's, it's hard to say, and I don't mean to be cliche, but genuinely the whole attitude in Formula E is anything can happen and it usually does. So it's, it's you don't, you don't want to write it off. It's, it's really tough. That gap is huge. And as you've pointed out, although we're changing track layouts, it's not like we're changing 
enough to maybe make a difference. So I'm actually really inter interested to see how the different track layouts, what, what they actually bring, because obviously in Formula One, we're facing something quite similar as well. Uh, in in double headers, which is, was never done in Formula One, um, we got away with it in Austria because Mother Nature got involved. Um, but you know, this we've got Silverstone, the second Silverstone instalment this weekend, and depending on what happens with Spain, we might have a triple header in one place. And obviously, it's much more difficult to change the layouts in Formula One than it is in Formula E. So I'm I'm actually quite intrigued to see how that does play out with all. Is it what is it six six rounds um, in one place? It's just, yeah. it's just that's just crazy. So yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see. I think it's hard, and it's really hard to get fans on board with the fact that we've still got races to go, and things could technically still happen. Like Hazel said, the maths the maths technically have everybody still in the running bar those uh, by those seven drivers that have been knocked out, but. It's kind of like with, with, with the way the season has gone so far, with the reasons that we pointed out as to why De Costa looks so strong and looks so comfortable and clearly likes this track. I don't, I don't know. How, what, 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 what mathematically needs to happen? He needs to DNF like how many well, times? 60, to, 68. To so if he... Um, I mean, okay. So Lucas Degrassi, uh, who was delighted... I might add, to discover that he is now P2 in the championship. And he was quite surprised um, to discover that in the post-race interviews. But um, I'm amazed as... he didn't know, because Lucas really <laughs> knows every single number. Maybe it was that fake, like, am I really? I honestly <laughs> didn't. <laughs> but, you know, that gif pretends to be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is um, brand new information. Like yeah, that kind of so thing. he probably knew the maths before the race. But, I mean... 68 points so if if Antonio had two DNFs and Lucas had a clean sweep of group stage pole fastest lap and win that would hit Antonio would still be eight points clear <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but there'd still be another two races and like I think the thing yes. that you have to remember is that um the last time somebody had a really big lead it wasn't this big but um, the last time somebody had a really big lead going into the last four races was Sebastian Boemi in season three. And um, he didn't... He did have a holiday, though. He did. Um, but also, like, cars that have been perfectly reliable, that have not had issues, have suddenly had them. Um, whilst we've been in Tempelhof, Antonio's had the perfect car for the past two days. We don't know that they won't well walk in on Saturday and be like, the whole powertrain's screwed. Like, yeah. Um, you know, I I don't think a the cars are going through um, an endurance race effectively right now. This isn't an event totally like anything else that Formula E has ever done. Um, we know that there are certain things that are just incredibly stress Formula E cars. Uh, yesterday was a little bit cooler, but today was quite a lot hotter during the race apparently, which might account for a little bit of sort of how the cars shook out relatively. Um, we know the Porsche has thermal management issues, so that's probably why it was kind of like a lot further back. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't you don't know that his inverter won't blow in FP1, at which point you've got a 20 place grid penalty and you're fighting back from who knows where um, with a drive through, <laughs> probably. Um, so I, th I think one of the things that's making it look like it's 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 maybe making him appear more dominant than perhaps he is is the fact that no one else seems to want to win it like <laughs> none of his title contenders going into these Berlin races have really done anything no I mean like Evans who has been so on it all season this looked like Evans season and when I spoke to him in the in the break and when I spoke to his team principal in the break and to be honest when I spoke to his teammate in the break they all I mean, he, he was sort of, like, nervous and excited for it. Yeah. Um, not kind of confident, but I have to say, like, his his teammate and his team principal were both kind of like, we need to get the season restarted. Or the team principal in particular, James Barkley, was like, we need to get this season restarted because Mitch is going to win it. Um, and, like, that... To see that turn into two-pointless 
finishes. Like, I mean, it's not inconceivable that he comes back and he's sorted. Um, and Antonio has an equivalently horrible time. Oh, I was muted then, temporarily. Sorry. Um, the <laughs> thing. So the thing. Uh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> like, oops, you're muted. Um, the the thing is with um, Mitch as well in the in the post race interviews, um, he did not look happy, and he was asked a question about where is um, where is the pace gone. And um, his response was, you know, I'd love to know because, um, and, and he kind of said, suggested that he doesn't feel like he's driving the same car as, as he was in, in Marrakesh. Um, so, and obviously Collado, we said last night, um, it, Collado yesterday was utter shit for Collado and today hasn't been massively more productive for him. I reckon I would Not to say that he is now. utter shit, but I, I reckon. Oh, sorry. No, go on. I reckon I would have come off the start line if I was uh, Colado today and just continued driving home. There's yeah. got to be. There's got to be a couple of fast charging points. Um, just get on the autobahn and yeah, yeah, just suck it all just off. Park it and like just just go away. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Colado's not. Collado started this season as the first ever teammate of Mitch Evans in Formula E. Um, and this is Evans' fourth year. It's Jaguar's fourth year. Um, two or fourth season. Um, Collado in Riyadh outscored uh, Mitch over two races, um, which is the first time that that has ever happened. Um, Bad. Yeah. Um, and, and like Mitch is so dominant within Jaguar. Like last year, he scored all but eleven points, so they got one hundred and sixteen points and one hundred and six or something. Oh, that's probably the wrong numbers, but it was it was all but eleven points, and he scored over a hundred compared to. Well, Mitch has uh, scored seventy uh, before Berlin. He had scored seventy eight percent of Jaguar's total points in Formula E. Well, he still scored that because they haven't scored yeah. any points. There you go. <laughs> you're the, I, I've said this before. You're you're the you're the stats person, Hazel. Uh, as well as Jaguar, seemingly not having a brilliant time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, BMW, uh, their pace seems to have dropped off quite significantly since we've come back. Um, it looked like it was going to be a really promising season for them. Uh, Sims, he got a win. He got a couple of poles. Gunter got a win. It looked like they were going to emerge as to Cheetah's main rival uh, in the team's championship. But I don't know. It, it, it just really has faded quite badly for them um, since, since, since the break. Um, any thoughts on what's happening there? Because it's a weird one, isn't it? How much a team can come back and, and, and be so far off the pace that they were at points earlier in the season. Um, I'd actually be kind of interested in what Jess thinks about this, partly because you're you're mostly an F1 person, or like you you have focused a lot on F1, and BMW basically don't exist in F1 or haven't for ages, like since Sauber or whatever. Yeah. Um, 2009, I think. Yeah, like, and then they've kind of sort of disappeared, and and they they were in DTM, which I realise lots of people watch, but or I'm just going to say it, it sucks. <laughs> um, and I, I will watch any flipping tin top racing and I'm sorry, I will not debase myself with the DTM. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, they've been in DTM, they've been in WEC, they've been in IMSA, which is great. And they, they had a lot of success in IMSA, uh, in GT cars. Um, and, and then they sort of wandered into Formula E post Dieselgate. Um, as with a lot of other German manufacturers, um, they had been sort of circling it for a little while because they were actually why Antonio uh, stayed in Formula E because um, they sent him to Formula E to Aguri, um, now to Cheetah. <laughs> um, uh, and they were like, 
go and test this car and he'd been testing Sebastian uh, Vettel's um, championship winning 2014 Red Bull car for the tyre test in Abu Dhabi or whatever, at the end of season test. Um, and then stepped into a Formula E car and was like, Jesus Christ, like my career is just like, this is dropping like a stone. Um, and, and BMW were like, no, stick with it. We want to know more about this. Like, we believe in you and we're going to give you a DTMC, but like, stick with this because we, we think there might be something interesting. And by the time he did the second race, he was like, no, I'm, I'm sold. Um, but yeah, like they, they have had some really good excursions in motorsport and some really terrible ones like their WEC entry, the big M8. We all loved the big M8. Who couldn't? Big boy. <laughs> the, the, the large boy. Um, but, uh, at the same time, it didn't really perform as a car. Um, and, uh, or certainly not in the same way that they were able to in IMSA. And, and obviously there are different regulations, even though they're both endurance series, but, um, and they, they sort of, they had a quite sloppy first year in Formula E as a factory team, um, with Antonio and, and Alex Sims the previous year. This year has actually been a little bit weirdly on and off. If you look at the results, like, um, Sims has had two DNFs, um, and one of them was was basically on the early laps of Santiago. And they've had quite inconsistent pace. Um, and as with quite a lot of the teams, like you quite often see. So Jaguar today was exceptional in that both drivers were slow. Um, but most of the time in Formula E teams at the moment, you're seeing one driver getting into like Super Bowl and the other one like way down, like for instance, Mercedes, where uh, De Vries was in Super Bowl and, and Van Dorn was 13th um, and, and like a few much bigger gaps depending on sort of like different teams but um, yeah they, they have had quite a sloppy year and the two drivers are sort of like they're both quite experienced we both everyone in Formula E knows they're fast but they're sort of I think everyone was surprised to see how far up the order both of them were. Um, and there's, it has been, it hasn't been as straightforward a year as the only team that both drivers took a win sounds. I, I think you were gearing up to ask Jess a question there. I, I was, and then but, I didn't, but, yes. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, <laughs> we'll bring Jess in. Um, Anything that you would like to add on BMW, uh, Jess? Yeah, they, as Hazel said, they're, they're just quite a weird beast. Um, it's, it, is, it is tough because I think it's obviously been amazing at how many manufacturers have committed to Formula E. That, it was a big, big, bold statement from a lot of manufacturers, but it's not just a marketing exercise. It's a racing championship. And to be competitive, you have to give certain levels of commitment and certain levels of uh, investment to the point where, you know, you might have pain years. You know, you, nobody expects, I mean, maybe you would expect a Mercedes to walk in and go, yep, nailed this and off they go um, based on uh, their kind of the current prowess across motorsports. But I hear they're doing it, quite well in F1. Oh, yeah. Mm, nobody talks about it ever. <laughs> So we just don't know really, but um, no, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's quite, um, it is just, it's just interesting to see which manufacturers have turned up with a, with a decent product and with a decent strategy and with a decent program and have gone racing and which have maybe seen this as a bit of like, Ooh, toe in the water. Cause I've been mm -hmm. told that this is good for, you know, our business and, uh, this is the future of motorsport, so you know we need to be here, and we'll wind down our other projects because that's what we've seen a lot is that that manufacturers are starting to wind down other projects, especially when there's like heavy combustion and no move towards at least hybrid technologies. Um, it's it, where else do you go? You know, like and and the the the, the economic situations have meant that 
a lot of series haven't been able to make that push into either fully electric or hybrid uh, technologies. So where else do you go? You go, you, you go to Formula E where it's already been set up and people have gone before you and you can either buy out teams that have already got the infrastructure and just whack your logos on it or you, you come and with a fully invested factory team. And it's, it is one of those cases of like, you know, have, have, have BMW got all their ducks in a row in order to have that consistent level of, of competitiveness that we've seen maybe in other teams. Um, you know, we've seen the likes of Toto Wolf has attended, and obviously he has, um, he has slight invested interests, pun intended, but um, yeah, he, he's, he's been there and he's, he's, he's interested in it. And obviously his, his wife is a, is a team principal. So, yeah, it, but I think it's that cohesiveness that is the difference between a team that wins and a team that can win and can attract brilliant drivers you know convincing a driver to stay in a series where they think there's no future here that's a that's a big that's a big thing to do that's a, and obviously you know you can throw money at them but money will only take you a certain level so it's I don't I don't personally know enough about the BMW Formula E team to be able to come up with a conclusion but it is I guess you know when we're comparing them against the manufacturers that have walked in to this season are they where you would expect um, BMW to be, given the fact that they've they've been looking and sniffing around this for a, for a long time. I feel like BMW. If, if you if you were to if BMW were a football team, they would be Arsenal um, because they on their day they can be fantastic and they can they can really challenge with the very best, but they often fail to live up to the potential that they suggest and i'm just looking at the the the, st uh, the driver's standings now and you know we talk about how bmw looked like they were on for a really really exciting season and now um sims and, and gunther are seventh and ninth in the championship and and you know they've been overtaken by i mean bird until um yesterday he he, he had a really poor season uh way me has had a bit of a mere season um and then sort of stoffel van Dorn has had a bit of a dip and and now he's come back and, and and lucas degrassi has kind of been sort of quietly chipping away scoring points but not you know he hasn't won a race so it's very open but it's just it's interesting that bmw have now sort of been shuffled down the pack quite a bit uh when i i really thought they were a dark horse possibly to even you know maybe one of their drivers could have could have won the whole thing at, the whole thing at some point but doesn't appear that's likely now um let's move on then because we are running a little bit short on time um a few things i wanted to talk about um so a few teams that have had a reasonably decent um return um audi a bit mixed um but they bounced back really well today. Uh, and as we mentioned, Lucas Degrassi has now moved up to second in the championship, which uh, he will be rather pleased with. Um, Virgin have, um, ha have, have had a really good day today. Double points, which I think is the first double points for Virgin since the opening race in Diria. Wow. Mm. Uh, which is mental. Yeah, uh, uh, Frines hadn't scored points for ages. Frines has had a shocker this season. He's been out qualified until today. He's been out qualified six out of six, which I think he's the only driver on the grid um, to to have that record. And he's he's been quite poor. He's gotten a lot of little tangles this season. He generally, even in, in terms of racing laps. I think Sam more often, maybe two thirds of the time or more, has been the lead Virgin driver in races. Um, but today, um, good qualifying for Fryens, and he had a really good battle with Degrassi and Van Dorn in the race, bagged a big hoard of points, and, and it was a good day all round for Virgin today, actually. Um, thoughts on Sam Bird? Um, we can never really count him out. Uh, he always pulls something out of the bag. He'll want to leave that team on a high, won't he? Um, is he going to just absolutely chuck everything at it now to try and get a win? 
because he he probably doesn't care if he can't win the championship. He doesn't give a shit if he finishes second <laughs> or third or fourth. I don't think he'll want to just go for a win. I think. Do you think? What do you I think? think? He, I think he wants a new third place championship uh, or a, a new trophy to replace the one that was lost. Oh, what well, he lost one, didn't he? Yeah. I I think he wouldn't argue with a bit of silverware. Yeah. Jess, thoughts on Sam Bird? He's got a, 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 sh- a shiny new teammate and a new team next season. Yeah, I mean, you always kind of want to leave a, on a good on a good note. You don't really want to leave on a downer and have anybody that would be there to criticise you, criticise you. Uh, and he does seem to be kind of comes out of nowhere and just kind of puts it puts it together. So, you know, never say never say never. Maybe it's it's amazing what um, psychological kind of situations do to a driver and I think we've got this is the this is peak psychological challenge right we've got as we've as we've already spoken about on the show a a crazy season just crammed in at the end where you don't get a chance to breathe and go away and reflect on your performance and come back uh uh, stronger and and you've got you've got all these strange things going on. So it's it's I think again across all motorsport this this year is just going to be it's going to be amazing to see who can handle that. Like who who can still perform at that peak level and not let that let that drop. Which is why you know maybe Da Costa is kind of peak that uh, in Formula E right now. I mean we're only as we as you said we're only talking two races into the restart, um, but. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anything against Bird. He, he's got, he's got the potential to, to pull it out. So, you know, if he's got that kind of like, oh well, gung ho attitude, just, just, just throw it, just, just send it up the inside of someone, see where you end up. Why not? Make the stamp. Yeah, exactly. I think um, so, like Bird was so miserable at points this season. Like before yeah. we broke, um, for the COVID. Um, I have never seen Sam Bird, who is really resilient. Like, I had to basically bully his PR, or the the Virgin PR, um, to uh, let me interview him, because I was like, I'm sorry, it's my job, I have to get a quote. (laughs) It's media pen, this is what happens. Um, Whilst he was like, um, um, uh, whilst he was like, crouching down, on the floor with his head in his hands in Mexico because he'd, he'd lost a, a clearly potential podium. Um, and like, it looked like the season was falling apart in the same way that season five had um, after what had looked like a good situation to not being anywhere near title contention by the final races. And I think like, if we weren't talking about the fact that we will know in a few days time who is the Formula E champion if we were leaving this race and there was a four week gap till the next one as you might well expect with the Formula E race then I think you know we'd be like well Sam Bird's on a flipping big recovery isn't he like like he's gone from 11th two days ago to like well in contention now um and leap well it's only five points off second in the championship now yeah exactly yeah like that's that's a flipping big for for a guy who had only scored uh, twenty seven points total to now be troubling the silverware is like that's it's not bad. Uh, one more thing, I I'll, I'll, I want to move on in a second to get a couple of predictions from you, but I just want to give a shout out to Mercedes today, who uh, in, in in very different ways provided. Um, some pretty solid entertainment so Van Dorn um, arguably one of the drives of the day uh, P13 to P5 and he was getting very racy um, and he pulled one move around the outside I think he might have had attack mode but he pulled one move around the outside was it Bird and Degrassi in my race notes I wrote wow (laughs) (laughs) I I think on the commentary it was like no, no stuff. That's not going to happen. That's not. Oh, oh no! It did. It did. He pulled that off. That has happened. It was genuinely like, now nah, this is going to end in tears. Oh, didn't that Jack say, please, like, please no, don't, stop do, don't it. do it? That was it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's done it. 
oh okay that was pretty good wasn't it oh okay yeah. <laughs> carry on I had, a, I had a lot of time for that move today that that was top draw stuff and also one of my other highlights of the race was Nick DeVries doing a <laughs> Nigel Mansell um was it in, in Dallas or something when he pushed his car and he fainted not like obviously DeVries mm. didn't faint but it would have been funny if he had done a little fake faint but hit the sight of him out of the car, which I, I doubt Scott Elkins would have been massively happy about. Uh, just thinks, oh God, I'm just going to get out and push now. What like was the motive behind on... that though? Like, why did he, I know it was in a weird no place, idea. but you know, why did he, why did he jump out? he knew he could get off the racing line and the car, um, so if you know you can safely get out of the car and your car can be put away, I suspect he was basically like, because we know that the Mercedes team have sent the pair of them there for Stoffel to win the championship. That's why he was unavailable to step into uh, Checo's car in F1, even yeah. though he's the reserve. Um, because they were basically like, you go, you win Formula E. Um, so I think De Vries was probably just like, I better not hold up my teammate with my bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate team player. Mm. Uh, he he I, I, was getting really racy today as well, was was Nick. He was, yeah, with like, was. lock up all over the place. I was like, calm down. <laughs> you, you, you'll get it. Calm down. <laughs> he, he did get his elbows out a couple of times. And I think there's a couple of drivers who might have a word with Nick DeVries. Um, I mean, I, I, I think he's been quite exciting in these last two races, but there's been a couple of moments where he's he's really got quite punchy with uh defending his position um it's a shame he hasn't he didn't I, I thought he he could have maybe got a podium today um but um yeah mercedes have actually looked fairly promising on pace actually since they've come back so i think it's not out of the question that we we, we might see a big result for coming um from them uh so before we wrap up I just want to get some predictions for you for the remaining races. Now, I know, I mean, it's a bit boring for me to say who's going to win the title because, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can if you want, if you really want to have a stab at that. <laughs> um, who do you think is going to win? Go on, have a long shot guess. Who do you think? Just pick a name out. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'd lo I would love to say... I don't know. I would love, well, no, because I wouldn't wish, I want Antonio to win because it, it is the perfect end to the story of shit to hit. Like, it, it's great. And we need another one of those stories because I think that will just then prove the worth of Formula E. Um, so Shit to hit. That's going to be the, the title of his... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm going to make a new feature on Inside Electric of, like, instead of, like, you know, like, hot or not in, like, smash it. <laughs> shit to hit. Shit to hit. Uh, well, if that's my legacy on Inside Electric, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll have it. I'll take that. I'll let you have that okay. one for free, guys. Um, <laughs> I don't usually come up with many of these, so you're there all. There you welcome. go. I like that. I think we can work with that. Um, okay, let let's have a wild prediction then. What? Um, give me a dark horse driver to get a big result in uh, the final four races. Based on what, if if Van Dorn can actually have a decent qualifying, I think I think he's because that seems to be his Achilles heel right now, right? Like like we just said, like Nick yeah. got into Super Pole and Van Dorn was way down in thirteenth. Like why? What? Sort it out, mate. Um, so I think I'd I'd quite like to see him get get a decent result over the next few races, but whether that happens, I don't know. Um. But I think, like, he's, again, I don't know whether it is kind of like the Formula One fan in me that I'm just like, I want to see these Formula One dropouts. That sounds cruel because it's not a dropout because they're doing well. Cruel. It does sound cruel. But these, like... Formula One exiles, Formula... like... <clears throat> I, I would say they've, they've, let's say they're Formula One graduates. They've graduated it's... Formula One. Well, did, did Stoffel, I don't know, if he, <laughs> he kind of was... Kind be kind. He'd been there, got paired with Alonso, got absolutely shadowed and because I mean that's the thing like that, that and what we were talking about earlier about Formula E as an evolutionary series and 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 evolving in terms of like we've got Nick we've got a Formula 2 champion in the series that's his big statement and a bit another big statement from a manufacturer yeah. saying you know 
despite the fact that we don't have any space for you in Formula One, like we are going to give you at least a decent seat in Formula E. And that's, that's, a, that's a big statement. And We and, don't like you as much as George Russell. Well, no. <laughs> sorta, Sorry, we've, we, don't, yeah. we don't appreciate that here. No, or you know, we've we've already promised George Russell too much that we've not been able to deliver on yet. So we can't promise you the same thing because well, that talk is. about don't even wild like Valtteri. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't oh, get me God. started on Marshas. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a whole other conversation for a whole different podcast. But um, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, it's it's those kinds of it's those kinds of stories that we need more of to prove that. Formula E isn't a dumping ground. It's it's where you actually get to shine and get to show your true potential. Because Stoff had a really shit time of it in Formula One, and he was you know, ripped to shreds. His career was absolutely ripped to shreds. He got made to look like a fool, and yet here he is having a flipping flipping stellar drive from thirteenth uh, all the way up to to P five. It's just it's just insane. Like that's 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 we want more of that. We want more of those stories so that we can tell and show people like. This is this is this is what Formula E is all about. Um, Talking about mad predictions, we, we did accidentally start a rumor in a couple of episodes ago that um, <laughs> about um, Sebastian Vettel going to Dragon, uh, which is which we had to clarify that. Oh, it's very unlikely. I, I thought you were talking about the rumor that um, both Vettel and Leclerc are going to be replaced by the two drivers who have departed Formula E. Uh, mid-season, Hartley and Fairline, who are both the reserves at Ferrari. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you yeah. go. Hartley, uh, Verline, Ferrari lineup incoming. Uh, Third right, season. we are. That's there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they're all going to get uh, COVID anyway at the rate that F1's going. So maybe that would be, maybe that will be likely, more likely than you'd. Expect. Well, I think I think Hulk is now official reserve driver for all teams. Yeah. So <laughs> he's just he's just desperate for that podium that you know that elusive podium I mean it is it is probably one of the I don't know if I've ever heard of a driver with worse luck than than Nico Hulkenberg but you know he can't be a reserve driver for everybody um the the beloved beard king of Formula E true true oh I miss Nick um, right, we are running very short on time. Hazel, one mad prediction from you for the final four races of this season. Uh, I'm going to go in hard and say that there are going to be 240 grid place penalties. Whoa. <laughs> that's for Collado. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's not uh, 240 individual penalisations. Um, I mean um, that there will be at least 240 uh, grid places that um, are issued. So at Formula E, like Formula One, if you replace parts that you're not allowed to replace, which is any of them, um, you are only allowed to have one set of everything per season um, and you're meant to be efficient with it. If you re replace a bit, the inverter, the battery, the entire fl flipping powertrain, like whatever, uh, then you face uh, grid place penalties. Um, it's 20 automatically. It's not as soft as the Formula One system. Um, and if you cannot move back all the all of those places, then up to 10 places, uh, you get five second penalty. And if it's over 11 places, uh, oh sorry, 10 places and under, it's it's a five second penalty. 11 places and over. Um, it's a 10 second stop and go. So it is really it is intended to hurt you and to, to discourage replacement of parts because the idea is that you're not chucking stuff out. You're not being wasteful um, and to keep costs low and like whatever. Um, we, we've already seen a lot. Um, I, I reckon we're going to see a lot more because, um, you know, these batteries are going to suffer um the teams are tired um and you know it's only one day off for the only 20 people who work in the garage on mm. both cars um with very very long days um and we get, we're gonna see stuff happen so yeah 240 uh grid place penalties for i don't know just stuff okay look forward to to that madness and then oliver turvey um winning 
going straight through the middle of everyone and their grid penalties and winning. Um, I think we can all get on board with that. Um, okay, so I think that's about it for this one. Um, we are, well, we have run over really a little bit, but it's okay. Um, uh, my thanks to Jess. Um, thank you very much for coming on. Um, and I made a really weird comment last night about, um, I asked you, um, how was your first time? And I'm going to rephrase that. Um, <laughs> your Inside Electric debut, uh, how do you feel it went, Jess? Uh, very enjoyable, memorable. Uh, I, will, I will carry that with me always. Good stuff. I think we can't <laughs> ask for more than that. Um, <laughs> thank you also to <laughs> Hazel. <laughs> thank you to hazel for your expert opinion um make sure uh to subscribe to the podcast um if um if you are listening to this so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes and we have four more uh coming up in the next week um one on the evening of each race hazel what were you going to say uh, also, if you happen to be uh, watching this on YouTube, which um, we uploaded the last one to YouTube and quite a lot of people did, um, please subscribe to our YouTube um, so that you get all our great content and weird stuff that we've got on there and stuff that I spend uh, ages editing and then no one looks at. So it validates. But do Hazel a favour and subscribe on YouTube as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so and also please leave us to review on the podcast on on wherever you get your podcast um as that does make a big difference to us to uh, for other formula e fans to discover our content uh inside electric are an independently run website so please do consider backing us on patreon if you're enjoying all of our bird in coverage and in return you will get some exclusive benefits including additional bonus content uh we do a monthly ask us anything video as well and we've we've spoken about a really wide mix of topics of that um you get early access to each um podcast episode uh including the ones where i'm up super late so last night i was up till one o'clock editing this uh, podcast and I still managed to give everyone early access so there you go um, you also get access to the inside electric discord chat which is a very strange world to be in uh, we are it's, it's, Hazel it's pretty normal for discord I just I just want to I'm new to the discord world so I, I, I don't uh, want to make us sound like proper elderly no no, that's just me. Uh, we are back on the weekend for races three and four in Berlin, and we will be joined by Naomi Panther, who has worked as a press officer uh, for several teams in Formula E. And we will also be joined by uh, award-winning Formula E photographer Lou Johnson. And Lou is actually in Berlin at the moment, and she is going to be joining us from her hotel room somewhere in Berlin, which is fantastic. Um, I've been your host, Rob Watts. This has been the Inside Electric Podcast, and we will catch you again very, very soon. <laughs>